Okay, hello everybody. Um, this is a recording of our usual live stream because we had like some technical difficulties. I hope you'll forgive us, but we're going to discuss this and hopefully you'll stay with us um, because we have quite the program for today. We have um, a discussion on the US defense bill and how it will impact geopolitics overall. And uh, following that, because it seems like it's related, North Korea, North Korea's ballistic missile um, trainings, or if, if we can call it that, we have um, a little bit of the situation on Israel and Hamas. Um, and then we have two little stories, but actually not super little, but if we have time, we're going to talk about um, President Modi in India and his handling of the security breach and crisis over there, and the old crisis and how it's impacting like the world prices and different markets. So quite the program for us today. Let's dive in with the US defense bill. So Sage, would you like to talk a little bit about the US defense bill and um, update us on what's going on overall? Yeah, it was like the um, yearly like bill to approve defense spending um, in US Congress. And it was um, there, you know, there were a lot of like important things on the table, um, particularly, you know, when it came to aid for Ukraine. And um, it was finally approved. There was there were some issues before because, um, like some members of some members of Congress, like the Republicans who are adopting like a more um, extreme or far right kind of stance on things, um, were just saying like they wouldn't pass the bill unless um, there were some restrictions on. Uh, transgender and uh, gay and lesbian service members in some ways, um, something having to do with their health care, their ability to serve. There had to be um, the Pentagon, like, wouldn't be able to pay for um, people to travel, like service members to travel in order to get abortions. Because, like, in some states, abortion is, like, largely banned for in most cases, right? So... But if you are a military um, service woman, you can, the Pentagon will pay for you to travel, you know, and get the care that you're looking for in another state. Um, but that was like controversial. So the bill was kind of delayed in, in passing. But yeah, it finally did get passed and it has $300 million um, for Ukraine. Um, up until September 30th of next year. It's like a little less than a year because like they were delayed in passing it, but that's all that it's authorized up to. Um, that's how long it's authorized up to. And yeah, so, but I think um, it is seen by a lot of people as a victory. I mean, it helping, you know, the Ukraine war effort and just keeping the military functioning basically. So yeah. And what happened was like, the, there was big bipartisan support for this. Um, a lot of Republicans joined in on like some compromised version of this bill. And it's definitely less aid for Ukraine because so far the war has been going on for um, close to two years now. And the U S has given Ukraine 61 billion dollars of aid so this is only another 300 million so it's you know not as much i guess it's a compromise but yeah they were able to you know agree on something so yeah that's how i would summarize it right so um obviously like there's talk but this is like the biggest budget um, approved for the U.S. defense as of today. So, like, how how does that feel to you, like us, that the budget is not increased like that? It seems like usually it would go towards the military and 
the US direct um, involvement in some other countries. But right now, like, Ukraine feels, feels kind of different, I guess, because it's like aid to them and not like direct military um, offense. But there is a lot of things that we don't know about, like, if we... If we if we look at the other topic of North Korea, we know that there are some um, aid and surveillance that is being sent all over the world um, to help allies. So, yeah, I it seems like there is um, there is a, a desire to kind of streamline and organize um, any war effort. From, from people from the West, people that have coalitions, allies, NATO, so that it's, it feels like it's less messy and more prepared on all fronts. And I guess that's what we're trying to do. Um, does it feel good to us? And do you feel like it's going to help with the coming year and any other threat that we can have, like, for example, Russia or China or North Korea or, you know, anything like that. Mm -hmm. I feel like it is, it is crazy. It's kind of like mind, it seems a little, a little um, interesting or even almost mind-boggling that it's the biggest budget ever because like you know the U.S. was fighting like at one point like two direct wars you know in Iraq and Afghanistan at the same time um they were doing a lot of things around the world at any given time but I guess what I'm hoping they're trying to do is like help increase others like productive capacities and their own defense capacities like and help the partners like build up themselves, you know, like, like with Ukraine. Um, I remember their defense minister, someone mentioning that, like you being like Ukraine transitioning to like creating more of its own weapons, doing more of its own military stuff because it knows that maybe Russia like might be a threat for a long time. And so hopefully it has to do with that, like bolstering the allies. But I guess it makes sense because like, there's like a lot of military threats going on now. Like the U S gives a lot to Israel. We know, and there's Russia invading Ukraine, there's China being aggressive in North Korea. So I guess it makes sense, but I guess we can't really know all the details, but I don't know. Yeah. You touched on something quite important in bolstering the allies and almost getting them to start being self-sufficient in some way or another. And that, you know, that sense of me is just, that's what the sense to me is that the U S is starting to feel like it's putting itself in the position of being source to those nations, which in and of itself is a bit of a challenge because in a country the size of the US, there's obviously significant requirements on its own resources for its own people. And so a significantly bigger budget starts to draw from somewhere because there has to be a source. And unfortunately, I feel like the US is playing too much in the source space and not necessarily playing enough in the help those countries become more self-sufficient. Right? I get that there are immediate concerns around immediate threats that require immediate action and aid in some way or another. But long term, there has to be some level of a sustainable solution that releases them from almost 
being at the forefront of providing that aid and is that aid at the expense of the U.S. nation? Mm. Yeah. yeah, there's something about it. There's definitely something about it, but then again, like we don't know all the details. Um, again, like it seemed the articles around it were saying that there was um, a wish to streamline the war effort. So what if like this was a year budget, but also a plan discussed with other countries in order to say like, hey, like here is what's going to happen, hopefully, and then we'll reanalyze and reassess and we'll move from there. And I think the difficulty for countries is that, um, you know, the geopolitics are always like ever changing. I don't think you can, it would be wise to like um, go beyond like nine months around like, um, you know, trying to resolve the problems. But I do agree that there is probably something, something where, um, we should find a system where um, the U.S. doesn't have to to provide so much and that each country can be their own. But like we don't know what they are investing in the growth of their allies either. So we'll have to see. And we have to also respect that um, a country of this size and of this military power just like holds the power and that's also a responsibility that comes with it uh, in a sense, like not in the way of like overarching and, uh, you know, overreaching and, and just going to every country, but just in the sense of like, hey, this is how the world works right now. But yeah, I do understand what you say. And um, well, we'll have to see because like, it's always like, it's an ever-changing um spectrum of things geopolitics so yeah we'll we'll just see how this goes and i think it ties up pretty well with um the other thing that's happened in geopolitics which is like north korea's um ballistic missiles test well there was one missile um but it wasn't intercontinental missile that they tried to launch and obviously like the, the headlines were a little bit dramatic but when you read the articles you realize that what they said was the ex explanation was that the submarine the u.s submarine missouri um entered the waters of busan which is like the military capital of south korea and so for North Korea, it's considered <clears throat> a breach or like a um, um, fight instability. And this was actually done in order to, in a streamline of events from South Korea to the US in order to like organize for what is going to come in terms of military in the next months and years and be prepared for everything and be prepared to like stabilize the situation um, in the Indo-Pacific. And so North Korea was like, hey, this is an aggression and they launched that missile and everyone was like on high alert. Um, Japanese authorities said that um, the, the missile fell into the ocean just outside of their marine borders, like their exclusive economic zone and I think it's so it's so like there's such a contrast between like the words um to kind of explain the aggression and the fact that they were the one that um made um, a whole region of the world like a whole ocean potentially because this could have affected like every each one of these countries in the Pacific stay on eye alert because of a potential like um a potential for war basically um so it's it's you know 
it shows that we're still we're still like managing this little little and big complex around the world and i think in that sense it's justified to kind of have investments financial investments into like looking into the situation and i guess more than um, taking offense and like going on land to try to attack to try to attack like invest in in surveillance and knowing how to stabilize the situation i think maybe that's the maybe that's the goal of the allies right here but i could be wrong like how do you feel about like what north korea did and is doing in general how that played out so for me there's a there's a there's definitely a concern in the show of whatever quasi force they consider it to be given that there are UN Security Council resolutions that they're also not adhering to and in the same and in the very opposite breath saying that a submarine in South Korea is a show of a potential threat to nuclear war when they continue to test their very own nuclear capability against a UN Security Council resolution. So it's almost a bit of a it's almost a bit of a forked tongue approach where they're doing one thing but also criticizing support in for support for South Korea in another way and on the other side. So it's kind of like it's very counterintuitive, but also probably and I, I, the word I, I like I just the, the word just kind of escapes me. But like I, I, I feel like it's disingenuous to complain about a submarine in South Korean waters when they choose not to adhere to a U UN Security Council resolution. So, you know, it's kind of like, I, I, I want my cake, I want to eat it, but I also want to eat it with a, gold, with a golden spoon as opposed to a gold-plated spoon. Like, you know what, get over yourself and toe the line or come to the party so we can actually have a reasonable conversation and find a reasonable solution. If we're going to talk about streamlining things, then maybe we should all put the crap on the table so that we actually know what we're dealing with. Yeah, they're the classic, like, narcissistic abuser who is gaslighting you, like, is always pointing the finger at you and saying, it's your fault, like, you are hurting me, you know, and it's just like, North Korea is like that, and um, yeah, Russia, and yeah, pretty much all, pretty much all of these, like, dictatorship places, and yeah, I don't know, like, what, the, I honestly don't know what, I, maybe you guys can give some ideas, but I honestly don't know what, like, the United States and its allies could possibly do to, like, resolve the situation completely. I feel like the best that anyone can do is just try to defend against anything that could happen, and but balance it with, like, not angering North Korea too much. But the worst North Korea could do is, like, is small compared to like what the allies could retaliate against North Korea with. So it seems weird that they're so they act like that. They're like the Chihuahua that it it's very fierce and it barks loud and shows its teeth, but it's just a Chihuahua, you know, but sometimes people do get really scared of it, you know? And yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no offense to them or anything but that is kind of the reality of what they're doing though and so but I don't know I just don't I just don't understand like I guess with an abusive person like that you just 
you put up boundaries and like you just don't play you don't want to play into their games and stuff and I mean what else can you do though you know I don't know I was thinking about that. Uh, we probably don't know the whole scope of things. Uh, I was wondering, like, why a few years ago, um, Olympic Games were allowed in Pyongyang, uh, for example. Like, I think that like, it was um, a little bit, you know, weird that it was allowed. Um, there is, like, so... There's such a weird way of... Um, of navigating the system at the moment like there's a system that says hey these peoples are probably bad and we should probably put boundaries with them but we don't really do that and we allow them to get enriched by having Olympic Games there or like World Cup there or things like that and um, I guess in a sense, it's uh, compassionate to still involve them in the system because they're still on the same planet as us, you know, and they still have a fleet and they still have, you know, um, um, exchanges with the rest of the world, but also like they're not respecting the, the things that make the world. Like, no um, UN... Uh, security systems were breached by the allies where like North Korea was said to actually breach the UN um, security council laws with their missile launched into sea or whatever wherever it was supposed to land um, so there's something about like uh I think the world needs to know how to actually put proper boundaries, possibly. I think it's a lesson for us. And yeah, I think it's a lesson in saying like, hey, you can't converse with someone that doesn't want to have a partnership with you. Like if they don't want to have a partnership with you, whatever they say they do, um, if they don't want to get into the world because it seems like, hey, it's a world made not by my rules where they're going to stay outside, but like, it's unfortunate. Yes, it's a world not made by your rules, but you're feeling outed, even though this is your world. Like we're all humans, right? It's not like actually countries making the world. It's actually um, the humans inside the countries that are making the world. And I think very it's um, spiritually, it's a huge um mistrust in, in your own power to say that and it's a huge insecurity which again um can a, a parallel can be drawn to like narcissistic people and how they're insecure and how they're projecting their insecurity onto other people so um, i think a whole uh, whole lot of lessons to learn on both sides and uh I think maybe once the lessons are learned, we can see that the situation wasn't actually that complicated. But I mean, like for now, we still got to see where this goes and we can be sure where this goes until like there is just a breaking point where, where maybe there is no, no, nothing to do but make a new choice for either of the parties. So part of my concern with the situation is for as long as they continue to push against these boundaries by millimeters or centimeters, they, dis they desensitize the world to their crap so that we get to the point where Oh, uh, you know they're moaning about the f they are they're moaning about the fact that we're testing another missile, and they're moaning about the fact that we're testing another missile, and they're moaning about the fact that we're testing another missile. So everybody starts to ignore them because they're actually just a stuck record. Except time number seven or time number eight, it's not about testing another missile. It's actually about a missile that makes landfall in a place that it shouldn't. 
So they dis, you know, it's almost it's it's literally that uh, what say what Sage was speaking to in terms of that yapper behavior. You tend to want to ignore it because it actually adds only nuisance value. Except there comes a point at which that yapper might just go further than their nuisance value yapping to an actual bite. Yeah, but it's then then you're just wondering though, how would you keep them from doing that? Like they keep like you're saying, like they keep pushing the boundaries, which you know so subtly or like like you said by millimeters or whatever, which is another like classic abuse tactic, right? Like just get people more and more desensitized to the abuse, right? But the question would be, how would you stop them though? Because um, other countries that don't like playing by the rules um, of the world that try to maintain order, you know, like uh, those other countries help North Korea, you know, and enable them. So it's like, what are you supposed to do really? You know what I mean? Like, I mean, I feel like it's the same solution, like just have a boundary with all of those countries involved and like, um, yeah, don't play into their games. And I feel like the world's been learning that with Russia too. Thankfully, it's like Russia's made things more clear for people maybe that like you shouldn't be involved with countries like that if you can, if you can avoid it. But I don't know. What else you can yeah, do? The world, in a sense, it feels like the world is already desensitized in a way um, because we're used to like all of these people's antics. But I don't see it as any different as something that would happen in a toxic relationship. Like in toxic relationships, sometimes there are like enablers. And these are people that consciously or unconsciously, most of the time unconsciously, enable the pattern of like someone that is toxic or narcissistic. And that doesn't stop um that doesn't stop people from realizing weight. I'm in a toxic relationship and it may take years, you know, but it still happens. So I think we we don't have to um, lower our trust in the fact that people are actually in the end going to realize that, wait, this is a toxic relationship and we need to get out. Because that's not any different than a relationship one-on-one -on -one with someone, I think. So we, we have to apply, obviously it's more complex and it takes more time, more decades maybe, but the same rules apply. Um, that's the fundamental principle of this discussion is that countries kind of behave like um, very complex individuals. And, and it's true, it's been verified. We, we just talked about how it's, uh, all of the countries are behaving like healthy or toxic people doing rational or irrational things. So that's the same, basically. So another thing that I think that we, we also need to take cognizance of is that if you start to look at the state of geopolitics across all of these instances of prolonged wars, prolonged sanctions, you start to realize that when sanctions were fully implemented against certain countries, it was a move that forced them into democracy. It was a move that forced them into shifting how they view lesser parts, less supposedly lesser parts of their populations or whatever, it served a purpose. And now we're starting to see these same sanctions not necessarily serving as much or achieving as much as they have in the past. And case in point, Russia, Ukraine, it's been carrying on since last year, February, or something like that. I mean, it's just been carrying on forever. The 
Israeli Gaza thing has been carrying on for over two months. There's kind of tentative desires to have additional ceasefires and stuff like that. And then you have this, you have South Korea and North Korea flirting on the outskirts of uh, an escalating conflict. And it just kind of starts to look as if there is a collective call for a new way of doing things. And that new way of doing things is potentially this new world order that we all keep on hearing about and talking about, but not necessarily knowing what it entails. So it might just be the precursor that starts to shift conversations in that direction. And we need to be aware that that could be the outcome or it could actually be the orchestration of all of these things that leads to that outcome. So, yeah, it seems like there is a need for something new here and we don't yet know what it is. And I think in that sense, it's good that we may be um, focus on Israel and Gaza right now, because there's definitely a need for something new that isn't happening. So what, I guess my, my question on this would be like, what is actually going on? Because we have discourses of wanting to have more aid entering Gaza, um, desires for a new ceasefire on Saturday, but then like um, the attacks are like doubling up of bombardments. I mean, are doubling up. Um, three hostages were accidentally killed in one of them. A hospital was destroyed. Medics were killed as well, doctors. And it's like, um, there is a, a desire for a ceasefire and desire for more aid. And at the same time, there is a discourse of like, um, no one on whatever side will stop until they get what they want. So why? Why? My, my question is just why? And I think maybe a lot of people are asking just why. And uh, yeah, it feels like very messy, very tense. Um, very like the world is like in dire need of a new choice here, but we can't do anything if like the principal individuals are not making new choices. So what is it? What what do we need? What what do we feel about the situation? And I think you've touched on the on, on two very important questions. And, and it's literally, what is this and why is it happening and what is needed to resolve it? So it's literally three questions. And again, we go back to one of our very early lessons in unionism, and that is not learning through contrast. And yet right now, there seems to be a lot of learning through contrast in order for people to make new choices. Mm. Yeah, um, it's interesting because like some of the objectives, right, of the bombardment. So basically the objectives are one, get the um, hostages, the Israeli hostages back, right? Israel, and that might involve a hostage exchange or uh, prisoner exchange, um, or and dismantling Hamas, like destroying Hamas as a whole, because this problem, I guess, has reached a boiling point to where, you know, the Israeli government and military want to like completely eliminate Hamas and try to like basically. They what they really want is they want a permanent solution to the problem, but I'm just not sure if that is what they're doing. 
you know, like creating a permanent solution to the problem because, yeah, I mean, if we look at that relationship, I mean, now, um, now the Hamas um, leaders are saying like, we won't do anything uh, when it comes to the hostages, like we won't exchange them until the aggression against our people stops, right? So like until the bombardment against Palestinians stops, and that's obviously like, well, that that makes sense that that they're asking for that and everything. And obviously, um, it's not good though uh, on their part, right? Because if they gave, they return the hostages, then that would stop, ideally, right, from Israel, or there would be some positive changes there for Palestinians in Gaza. So obviously Hamas isn't acting in integrity in any in any way, right? But on the same at the same time, like Israel is the Israeli military has killed like what is it by now? Like it's like nineteen thousand Palestinians and just a handful of people involved with Hamas, you know, and it's just like it's very insane. It's like very it seems incredibly, incredibly brutal. And it makes you wonder, like, is there no other way that they could, like, secure the hostages? And, um, yeah, is there no other way to do that? And also, obviously, Hamas, you know, can just use that as more propaganda. Like, the more damage Israel does, the more collective anger that they can harness there in, like, the, you know in the Arab world and the Muslim world and anyone who listens to them. So I feel like this is, it's just like really counterproductive. That's not to say that any of us is like an expert on this situation because we're not, but I don't know you guys, like, don't you feel like that's a pretty like logical assessment, at least at the surface or is it, it, it would, is there more to that? Like why Israel is like, trying to level Gaza. I mean, obviously, if you want to try to destroy Hamas, Hamas is so interwoven purposefully in Gaza. Like, there's not just, like, one Hamas fortress. Like, they're just, like, this is Hamas HQ. It, no, they're deliberately woven into Gaza. So destroying Hamas completely, it kind of, you know, entails that destruction of much of Gaza, which it's, like, is that a worthy goal? then right now you know what I mean so yeah but you guys tell me what you feel and think about this because I know this is such a, a thorny issue yeah I don't know yeah I think there's like I feel there's a huge level of distrust on both sides so even if Hamas is like okay we'll give back the hostages we want ceasefire Israel's like, mm, I don't know. I don't think there will be ceasefire. I think like there will be like more terror, more violence, even if we get back the hostage. And Israel also has hostage and prisoners from um, Palestine that they're both holding on to so that they can get the upper ground. So I resonate with what Granville was saying about this contrast. And instead of trying to find even ground on both sides, they're just trying to experience contrast. And neither one of them is willing to give up their reasoning to be right in order for peace. Like, I think it's very prideful on both sides and allowing people to die because of that. I have to agree with Nadja. I feel like it's, um... Obviously, like people are suffering, there's real suffering, but do you think that the real suffering is the primary motives for governments and groups that are uh, at play in this war? I'm not sure. I feel like there is very much an instrument, instrument, instrumentalization of people's real suffering in that space. And I think that's what's um, disgusting for me because it's not Palestine like that we're supporting, that it's it's Hamas trying to instrumentalize the suffering of people 
to have what they need. So it may seem altruistic, but it's not. It's very selfish for them. And same for Israel. It's like, obviously, it's the, the only way to stop Hamas because enough is enough. They have been in control of Gaza since 2006. And we're like, and what? So like, we're, we're going to continue killing Palestinians like Gazans and accidentally killing the hostages that you want to free? Like, um, I don't know. And obviously, like, maybe, again, we don't have all the answer. Peter Zian, um, geopolitician for people who haven't watched the previous discussions that we've had on him, said that the war was going to be brutal on both sides and it's, it was not going to be pretty anyway because this is war. Yes, but I think at the core of war and at the core of like this conflict and the ideas of humans on both sides of this war is very much pride and anger. And I think if we remove the pride and anger, I think there, there would be like so much relief and potentially like, I don't know, solutions would appear that cannot appear right now if we continue to run on pride. It's going to burn quickly and it's going to be ugly, you know? And uh, we're not going to find the actual solution. Kind of like when we do spiritual work, it's like we're trying to find all the solutions and we're trying and trying and forcing and controlling. And then we sit back and, and we take a breath and we're just like, okay, the situation, the situation is bad, but how does it make me feel? And then when you're peaceful, you're like, hey, maybe um, I don't know the best course of action right now, but I have a new idea. And suddenly this new idea feels like so much more peaceful than the rest. And you cannot do that if you're not humble about yourself. And I think nobody is this, in this war is humble to a point where they actually understand the suffering of people. They're just trying to in instrumentalize it and video it for the world to watch. And that just irks me. Like, that's, no, that's not. Like, I want to see people suffering because I see people suffering to, like, support a political side. That's not, no, that's not what I want to see. You know, that's just playing on the emotion of people. And, and um, it's even true... It's even making us wonder, like, if this ceasefire is just like to kind of continue to stoke the fire of the attention of this war, or is this like genuine? Like, what what is actually going on? And I think maybe we we won't have answers until again, like, people surrender their pride and actually like stop to think. So yeah. So certainly part of the part of the challenge is that again, if we take if we take these two nations as seriously complex individuals or three nations, because let's let's just put Hamas in a league of their own and not necessarily call them Palestinian. But if you take all of this, all of these three entities as complex individuals, then you then you need to start to also consider and remember that anger and aggression is hurt and sadness as older sister or older brother. So there are fundamental core wounds amongst these three entities that are just uh, not necessarily that have never really been healed. And while I'm not advocating for separation, there is also an opportunity, there's also a time at which they kind of need to let each other go and accept each other's sovereignty, which might mean dividing the land. There, there could also be that as a solution because right now it's, it sounds and feels like choosing to learn through contrast based on a choice of insanity. There's like a serious 
lack of respect for life. And you know, we can we can prettify the pig as much as we want to excuse the French under these circumstances in this conversation. I mean, you, you're putting lipstick on the pig and makeup on the pig does not all of a sudden make it pretty. The fact of the matter is there is a core wound where neither of these parties are prepared to recognize each other's sovereignty as human beings. And the challenge with that is that they will continue to justify their seriously aggressive behavior for as long as they possibly can under the guise of it need, something needs to be obliterated. Well, maybe the something that needs to be obliterated is that you actually start to respect the humanity of other people. I agree. And I also feel like there's this deep wound of victimism that Yurin was mentioning in all three entities. And it is also very insane because they are victimizing their hurt and the, the injustice that they're experiencing all so that they can reach a goal of identity when really our true identity is sovereignty and we have a source. And for them to perpetuate this violence just so they could hold on to their identity, hold on to their statehood, is really playing into um, this illusion that you need to create your own identity and one identity is better than the other identity. Yeah, I think there's a pretty big pattern of like justification of the insanity it, in all of our stories tonight. And I think it makes me think, and we can like spend five, do five minutes on this, um, about like Modi, Modi, I don't know how to pronounce his name, Modi in India. And this big national security breach um, purported by like six person, six people. Um, and I think there's something weird about it. Obviously, like national security breach, you need to act fast, you know, you need to act. You need to bring decisions fast. But also this is highlighting um, that over the years, Modi has been... Um, seen. Modi has been seen as um, by say by Isaiah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, Modi has been seen as a dictator by some for quite a few years, and uh, at some points, it's not always it's not it's not always seen as a dictator because sometimes it's, he does good things <laughs> for the country, but sometimes he is sorry, seen as a dictator. And the fact that it doesn't want to have debate with the parliament about how, what to do and how to handle this situation is um, for most people confirming his dictator ways. And also like the, one of the six people that did this national security breach was like, um, the, the core message of this act for him was like end to the di dictatorship. And Modi was like, Modi is already calling them like terrorists. Terrorists, it, it's a digital, it's a digital breach. So it's kind of, yeah. So I think this, this crisis basically, and I think maybe there's a lesson there, but the crisis is kind of revealing um, the personality of people. And it's not to say that is like the harshest man on earth, but there is to him maybe some things about like not necessarily wanted to discuss with people, having debates and taking kind of like autocratic decisions sometimes. Um, and that is people don't agree with because at the end of the day, like the people were the ones that elected you and maybe they have 
something to say about you and maybe not and maybe we are wrong but like it seems like a lot of people are saying like hey man <laughs> this is not how we want to govern India so what are you going to do about it and it's kind of complex because again security breach we need to act fast um, and I think this is his justification but there is also also, there's also a lot more to this story. So how do you feel about that? Like, what's the, the core of things, like the feelings? So again, it's it's kind of I mean, literally, and you started off, you started it off perfectly saying this is, seems to be a lot of justification of the insanity. So while he's refused to have the debate, is also instituted a full-on investigation. And we kind of have to wonder, like, I mean, how long does an investigation take in the first place? So, again, that desire or need, it's because it's actually not a desire at this point, that national security would probably be a much more dire need to solve faster. So what is the state of how the investigations run and what value will it add to securing the country if there has been a national security breach, if you, if there is no immediate action. So it's kind of this debilitating thing of we know there's a problem and while I don't want to have a conversation with you, I'm going to do the thing that I want to do, which is this protracted investigation uh, in the hopes that you kind of lose interest because I actually don't want to share my power. So there's like, you know, like there's just, there's just this, again, insanity. It's it's literally like, does this make logical sense under logical circumstances for the logical needs of a nation? And I can't comfortably say that I can answer yes in any sense of the word under these circumstances, given that I would I would treat national security as a much higher priority than anything else. You also need to you also need to consider that a debate could actually surface much faster, easier, cleaner routes to solve the problem than a protracted investigation. So what is his whose interest is he placing first and for how long does the country accept that before they start to make new choices? Yeah, he has, Modi has been showing subtle acts of dictatorship throughout his presidency. And I feel the, there may be a hidden agenda of why he doesn't want to discuss this and it could reveal uh, more of his character with this discussion and with this whole investigation unfolding. Yeah, I know that is suspicious, um, but yeah, I was watching like news coverage on online um, news agent Indian news agencies and yeah they kept mentioning that that Modi was like no discussion is necessary about this and I'm just like yeah I think it'd be great if you guys could dig into that more and also just kind of tell me what happened more but like and, and if you're in the world the news like doesn't always give you like a really simple clear explanation of what happened and everything but we kind of figured it out <laughs> But I don't know. And then terrorism, if you call it terrorism, I mean, it is, it's defined as like the use of, um, the Ill unlawful use of violence or intimidation to achieve some political end. So it could be like, if somebody is trying to like digitally breach a government, it could be an act of terrorism, but it depends on like what exactly they're doing. So, but I didn't, I didn't remember, I don't recall the details of what they did, but I don't know if it qualifies as terrorism, but it's definitely a word that you shouldn't use lightly. Like just not everything, everyone who poses you isn't terrorist. 
Did you know Yurin or do you guys know? I have no idea what the security breach actually did and that's the thing i have no idea what the security breach did we don't know what it is um it's a murky situation and also we don't know how the state of investigations are conducted in the country and if they need updated which could have been discussed in a debate as well even though like it was a crisis debate over like 24 hours like they're so there's so much like so many loopholes, like so many gray areas so where we don't know what is actually going on. So yeah. And the interesting thing is that you want the decisive action of saying this is the route we're following. We're just not sure if that decisive action that he has supposedly implemented is the best course of action. And in fact, we're probably more sure that it's not the right course of action. But, you, you know, it's kind of like this double-edged sword that you want decisive action, but you don't want autocratic decisive action. Yeah, and that's where democracy comes in. You have to have a relationship of trust with your parliament, that your parliament in maybe one night of like crisis assembly can decide for you what is the best course. And so in that sense, really, it is like an autocratic decision to go your own separate way and do an invest investigation. And I think a lot of countries actually do that sometimes and it doesn't feel right. You know, it's like, it's your, your country, your system, your political system was based on parliament. So you even if you don't like it like you have to go with your parliament and that's where you see separation and parliament being in opposition and not being with you and not working with you and and things being even more slow because they feel like slighted and with reason like there's no trust there mm. you know yeah <laughs> so yeah um that's really like I think there was an overarching theme for today. We couldn't go into like crisis and the old prices, but um we are having um twenty twenty three recap next week, and I think probably like all crisis um and the situation of crisis of resources is going to be one of the things that we need to mention. And we're going to basically go to all these meta subjects that we see, um, we've seen this year. So geopolitics and climate change and economics and religion, culture, LGBT rights. And we're just going to go through each of them and say like, all right, what, what has been going on in economics or what has been going on in politics, what has been going on in culture? and see what stayed with us and maybe what we can learn as a lesson and go in 2024 with like the best course of action and most, possibly some ideas and some healing. So yeah, that's um, what we're going to do. Renville, would you like to conclude the discussion? Awesome, yeah. And I, I think one of the, the thing that you mentioned just before you did that wrap up was, that, 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 that there's a very significant thread of a lack of trust just kind of really surfacing throughout all of these stories, which I think if we took a year in review, we probably see it as a very common theme across many subjects. But yeah, thank you to, every, thank you to everybody for watching our recording. Also, please feel free to like and subscribe to our Church of Union YouTube channel. Thank you to the team for the conversation. And we look forward to seeing all of you again next week as we do our year in review wrap-up. Thank you for a break. Bye-bye.